من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وشفي المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين لا سيما مولانا وسيدي صاحب الأسر والزمان روحي وأرواه العالمين له الفداء وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولعنة دائمة على أعدائهم ومنكر فذائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي for the hastening of the return of our 12th Imam and our awaited Savior, Imam Al-Hujjah, one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. As we continue in these nights of Muharram, we've reached now to the fourth night. And tonight also being shab Juma, Thursday night, it's as I just mentioned, a night of prayer to Allah. Just to go off of my topic for one or two minutes, you know, one of the things that sometimes we assume is that these Thursday night gatherings, other than in Muharram, just in our regular Thursday nights, we, set, we tend to think as maybe the youth especially, but maybe all of us, we tend to presume that these are just cultural phenomenons. Something that our mother and father brought from back home, whether it be from India or Pakistan or the Middle East or wherever we've come from. And we sometimes think that these are just, again, a cultural experience that they used to do back home because Friday was a holiday, so they would get together and sit and listen to a talk and have food and, and get these sort of events. I just wanted to, again, mention one point that actually nothing could be further from the truth. Maybe we don't have in the hadith the special format that we have these majalis on Thursday nights. But we have clear hadith that tell us on the Thursday night, the day preceding Friday, is a very important day. For us as Muslims, we know that our day begins on the sunset of the preceding day. So Friday is not at midnight on Friday, on Thursday night going to Friday. For us, the Jumma starts at Thursday at sunset until Friday at sunset. And the hadith are clear that this time period of 24 hours is unique within the week. Right? There are special mercies coming down from Allah in this time period. We can't enumerate them, we can't really fathom them. But just take my word for it, maybe one other time we'll discuss it in detail. But we have hadith that show us the importance of these gatherings. And so just as a reminder for myself and for all of you to keep these gatherings alive, where we recite the dua of Komail, as we just heard being recited, where we gather, maybe we'll have a bit of food in, on a regular Thursday night. But we have to keep these alive, to keep our energy, keep our spiritual vitality alive through the rest of the week. With that said, tonight I want to look at the topic of the supplication, the weapon of the believer. And in all honesty, when I was planning this series of lectures, maybe two or three months ago, I had no idea that this topic would fall on a Thursday night. Literally, and it's not a fluke, I don't believe in coincidence. There's no such thing in our vocabulary as chance. I think Allah guides us in everything that we do. And somehow, when I put these topics together, one of the topics was on the dua, and it just so happens that tonight, being the night of dua, the night of dua kumail, that I have this opportunity to speak tonight about the supplication, being the weapon of the believer. You know, we live in a world, we are all living in this country or whatever, wherever we live in these societies. And we know that our faith is constantly under attack. Right? For those who are the sisters who wear the hijab, obviously they are the vanguards of our religion. Right? For them it's a completely different challenge that us as men will never experience. 
Because our sisters, when they go out there with their hijab on and their abayas or whatever they wear, immediately they are recognized as Muslim women. And they are really in the crosshairs of those who are against this religion. Us men, we leave the gathering. If we have a beard, well, you know, the beards are trendy nowadays. So people don't know if we're Muslim or not. Right? We don't look as Muslims. We don't wear turbans when we walk down the street. Even I don't wear a turban when I walk down the street. So nobody knows men if we're Muslims or not. But our sisters, they feel the brunt of the challenges out there. And we know that we live in a world where not only are we under attack by non-Muslims, those who are antagonistic against Islam, but we know as followers of Ahlul Bayt salam, peace be upon them, that we are even under attack by so-called Muslims. And you see the news. You see where our harams are destroyed, where people are targeted, like in Pakistan, like in Parachanar, like in Afghanistan, like in Bahrain, in Yemen, only because we love the Ahlul Bayt salam. And isn't it strange that that is a Quranic injunction Allah says, "Kulla as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al-mawaddata fil qurba." Our messenger told the Muslim ummah, "I ask you no reward for this message, except that you love my family, and we, as an extension, love the family of the Prophet, and we are targeted because of that." The question is that what can we do to prevent those attacks? What can we do to protect ourselves? Now this isn't America where you can walk around with a 9 millimeter in your back pocket and kill somebody if they you know, do something to you. We live in a society, you live in a society where hopefully violence isn't at that level as it is in America or other countries in the world. But our messenger, our beloved prophet gave us the secret to protection. And when he was asked that should I not guide you to a weapon that will protect you? They, the companion said, of course, Ya Rasulullah. And he says that, Ad-du'a silahul mu'min. That the weapon of the believer is the du'a, is the supplication. Right? When we have Allah as the one who's protecting us, we don't really have to worry about other things. That doesn't mean we don't stay vigilant, we still are smart, we, wa we watch where we're going. But we realize ultimately at the end of the day, that if we are firm on our connectivity to Allah, if we are firm in our supplications to God, that He will be that protection that we need. He will be that shield that we look for in times of difficulty and stress. Last night when we looked at the parents, I talked at the very end very briefly about a dua that we make about our mother and father where we said waqfid lahuma janah al-dhulli min ar-rahma waqfid lahuma waqfid lahuma janah al-dhulli min ar-rahma that lower to your parents out of mercy the wing of humility wa qul rabbi irhamhuma kama rabbayani saghira o oh allah o oh my lord have mercy on them as they brought me up when i was a little child that was a dua that we make Tonight I want to further expand, not that specific supplication, but I want to talk tonight about dua in general. The philosophy of duas. Why do we spend, for example, so much of our time in dua, in supplication to Allah? First off, what does this word dua mean? Right? We have to go to the root of the Arabic to understand all of these concepts. When we look at the word du'a in the Arabic linguistic approach, the word du'a comes from an Arabic word, obviously, and it literally means to call, to call upon somebody, to invite somebody. And obviously there are multiple derivatives of this word based in the Qur'an. We see that Allah uses the same root of du'a to mean an invitation. So for example, when Prophet Noah is speaking in the Qur'an, he says that inni da'awtu qawmi laylan wa naharan that indeed Allah I called my community day and night to come to Islam to come to your submission he used the same root word of dua da'wah to invite people to 
religion. Allah also uses it in chapter number 40 where Allah says, Udu'uni astajib lakum, call upon me, dua, Allah says, Udu'uni astajib lakum, and call upon me and I will answer your call. So in a nutshell, this word dua, what we use, dua means to call upon. And here we mean we are calling upon Allah. Right. Dua doesn't mean I am sitting and looking at my smartphone and watching the PowerPoint presentation go by. Right? If we're doing that to read the translation in the Arabic, great. But just looking at the screen is not dua. Just hearing somebody in the majlis recite dua kumail and we just listen to it. That's not making dua to Allah. That's listening to somebody calling upon Allah. But guess what? That person isn't like the Imam of Salatul Jama'at where whatever he says, it, fo you know, it goes for all of us. We have to follow along in those words because we are calling upon Allah. We're not listening to somebody calling upon Allah. We want to be actively calling upon Allah within these du'as. And you know, as a community, as followers of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, we are so blessed. You know, we are blessed to have du'as for every occasion. Different months in the year, Dhul Hijjah comes along, 9th of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Arafat. We have the du'a of Sayyid al-Shuhada. We have the du'a of Imam Zainul Abideen, peace be upon them. That's on a monthly level, once a year. Every week we have du'a kumail. Every week we have du'a nudba, we have du'a tawassul. Every day we have the du'as for Monday, for Tuesday, for Wednesday. And believe it or not, even in our books of du'as, we have du'as for every hour of the day. Just like Big Ben sing, you know, signals at 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock the bells ring at Westminster or Big Ben, we have du'as for every hour. 12 o'clock hits, we have a du'a to recite. 1 o'clock, there's another du'a. 2 o'clock, another du'a. We have all of these supplications that the Prophet taught us, that our Imams taught us. You and I can talk to Allah in our language. We can use English, we can use French. Those who, for example, can't speak, they can use sign language and talk to Allah. Allah knows every language. But you know, when we use the words of the Prophet and his infallible family, it's a different experience altogether. If you were just following Dua Kumail tonight, and you just look at the way that the translator has rendered the words of our Mawla, it blows the mind to see with what connectivity our Imam is speaking to Allah. Now obviously he's taking his conversation to God at a completely different level. Right? It's just like if you were a university professor, or you're a student in university, your professor will talk to you at a particular level. But that professor, when he goes home to his two-year-old, he'll talk to his two-year-old like that child is a two-year-old. Right? So when you and I talk to Allah, it's at a different level. It's Allah, I want this, give me that, give me this. But when the Imams of Ahlul Bayt talk to Allah, it's at a completely different level altogether. And so we have to appreciate the fact that we have been blessed with this heritage, right? The dua, the calling upon Allah. But what is the wisdom and philosophy of it? Because some people have asked me in the past, in different gatherings, that we as Muslims say that Allah is all-knowing. He's alim. He knows everything. Allah knows everything that I need. He knows what is in my heart. Why do I even need the concept of a dua? If Allah knows that I need food, I need clothing, I need shelter, I need money to pay my mortgage, I need this, I need that, why do I make dua? Allah knows it. Why not just give it to me as I need it? I need a paycheck today, why don't just give it to me? I need a spouse when I get to a certain age, just get a spouse ready for me. Two things and then we'll move on. One is that we have the saying in English that you don't get what you don't ask for. Right? If you don't ask for something, don't necessarily think that people will come and hand it to you. Right? Even your mom and dad, your parents, right? even though they know you need certain things, but sometimes your mom and dad, they want us to ask them. Because right? they, maybe they enjoy hearing them, their child asking them for something. Now Allah is not that, at that level that he, you know, he gets pleasure out of us asking. But ultimately we're told, ask for everything in your life. Hadith tell us, 
even ask for the shoelaces on your shoe. Even the hadith says, ask for the salt that you put on top of your food. Because if Allah does not want you to get the salt or the shoelaces, guess what? Allah can prevent even you and I from getting something so trivial and insignificant as our shoelaces. So at level one, Allah knows, but He wants to hear you and I articulate those needs to Him. And at a second level, it makes our heart go at rest. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul kulub, as the Quran says. It's through the remembrance of God that our hearts go to rest, d develop tranquility, develop ease, develop that peace of mind that we so need in this crazy world that we live in. So don't think of the dua just, God give me and I'll take. Think of the dua as being coming a mental change in the way that we perceive the world and how we perceive many things around us. And if we look at the dua in that aspect, in, in this initial stage of this discussion, then hopefully it'll make a bit more sense why we make dua, even though Allah knows everything that we need. The philosophy of dua. Let me go into this for a few moments. And it's a bit of a difficult discussion, so I'm, really trying, I'm gonna really try to water it down tonight, um, just to save our own mental um, sanity and my own mental sanity. I'm just going to give you a, a very simple explanation and understanding of the dua tonight. See, the world that we live in, we know that it's based on some rules of cause and effect. We have different physical rules. There are some different physics of the way the world works. We have gravity. We have all these different rules of physics of how everything is put into motion and running. And we know that Allah puts all of this into practice. He put it into place and now it runs on a specific system. Like Surah Yasin says, where Allah tells us that the sun is there, the moon is there, and they run on their own orbit. The sun can't, the, the night can't outstrip the day. The day can't overtake the night. وَكُلُّ فِي فَلَكِ يَسْبَحُونَ As Allah says, they all float in their own orbit. Now that's in the physical world that we live in. But we also believe that as human beings, we also have a metaphysical reality. We have a body and a soul. The body is physical. The soul is what the ulama call mujarrad. It is immaterial. But we believe that we are, a, we are that entity comprised of a body of the physical and the soul. And so because of that, because there's a physical and the spiritual, we believe that there are unseen forces that can control and that do control and change the workings of the world. It's maybe what the Westerners or the Eastern people call karma, right? We've heard this word karma. Somebody does something bad and we'll say that karma will catch up to him. Right? You know, what goes around comes around. Well, for us that karma is Allah. Right? For us, that karma is in, in, in a way, an aspect is dua. Right? That it's not just chance that somebody does something and there's a reaction. Right? How could we explain that? That somebody does something bad and something bad happens to them. You can't blame that on gravity or the laws of physics or the laws of nature. There's something else behind the scenes at work. And so when we look at that from that aspect, we realize that something else is also governing this world. It's not just at the physical level. And that's where we get into this understanding that there is a concept of predestination in Islam. There's a con and again, I'm, I'm just going to be very brief. I don't want to go into a lot of the discussion because it's, uh, it's time consuming and it, may it would definitely detract from the topic tonight. But we believe in things being predestined for our lives. Now, we don't believe in, for, in predestination as other Muslims, that every single action, that if I go to kill somebody tonight, that Allah destined for me to do that. We don't believe that. We don't believe that if I go to the pub tonight and drink, that Allah destined for me for that to happen. Because that would go against the justice of God. That would negate a need for heaven and hell. Because what kind of a God would force me to sin and then punish me? What kind of a God would force me to pray and then give me paradise? 
It's a very hypocritical God if that is my understanding of God. But we have destiny. Everybody in this room, we were born on a particular day, in a particular city, in a particular family, whether they be Muslim or not. I had no choice where I was born, who I was born into, like what family or where. That was destined by Allah. Nobody can change that. When I die, I can't determine where I'll die, when I will die, or how I will die. That's been foretold by Allah. It's written in stone. We can't change death. We can, and even that's a bit of a, a, a misnomer because we can change our time of death. But generally speaking, those things are destined. When I will die, Allah says that will definitely happen. Everything between those is a part of the dua, isn't it? We gather in Ramadan, 19th, 21st, 23rd on Laylatul Qadr. Why? Because we're told those are the nights of Qadr, the nights of destiny, the nights of power. And our parents and the scholars say, come and make dua and change your destiny. Come on the 15th of Sha'ban, the night of the birth of our Imam, of our Savior, and make dua because you can change your destiny. Come on Thursday night and recite du'as to Allah because you can change your destiny. And all these other du'as are there to change things within our lives. So yes, certain things are written in stone, life and death, but everything in the middle between those two experiences, you and I can alter through the du'a. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And there's the famous story that I'm sure we've heard of. I'll repeat it again tonight. It happened at the time of the beloved prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. He's with his companions, the disciples, the Hawariyun, as they're called in the Quran. And there is a woman in the community who's getting married. She's getting married to a man, obviously. And sometimes we have to clarify that, that marriage is between a man and a woman. Because in some countries it's legal, but obviously in God's scriptures it's not permissible anyways they're getting married and Jesus tells his disciples that that woman she's not gonna live till tomorrow morning she's gonna die on her wedding night so the companions were like you know they're 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 shocked first of all hearing this news of the unseen but they're like okay we believe you you're the word of God right you are the spirit of God you know better than we do the night passes next morning the bride is coming out of her husband's house and the companions are just flabbergasted. They're floored. What do you mean? Jesus, you told us she would die. You're wrong. And this is where we understand at one point that prophets, they have ilmul ghaib, knowledge of the unseen. But keep in mind that it's only when Allah wants them to know the unseen. Just like our imams. We believe they have access to it but only if Allah wants them to know it. So Jesus was perplexed. He went to Allah, he asked, Ya Allah, you told me she would die. My companions are asking me what happened. And Allah reveals to his prophet Isa, peace be upon him, he says that, yes, I had written that she would die. But we have a concept at his time and our time that if you give in charity, you can change your destiny. And so God tells Jesus that on the wedding night, a beggar knocked at the door. It was her wedding night. She was with her husband. She answered the door. She gave the beggar some money or food or some clothing. And that act of charity changed her destiny. That act changed her fortune. So Jesus goes and tells this woman the story. They say, let's go back to the house. And they look under the bed. And sure enough, there's a snake there that would have killed her. But through that event of charity, her, de her, 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 de her destiny ended up changing. Moral of the story is that charity is one way. The dua is another way that you and I can change our destiny. And so when we make duas to Allah, don't think that you expect something to happen right then and there. It will change our destiny, maybe not today, Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not 10 years from now, but keep in mind that God would never go back on his word. And he promised us in the Quran that you call on me, I will answer you. 
that Allah will definitely answer our du'as. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. On a side note, I met a person many, many, many years ago, and he shared with me the story about du'a. Again, because sometimes we expect our du'as to be answered instantaneously. You know, there's this Hollywood movie that came out one time where this character is playing God in the movie. And he opens up his computer and there's two million emails of du'as, of prayers. And rather than going through each through every one, he just hits all and accepts all of the du'as. Right? It doesn't work like that, you know, it's not that easy. Sometimes, and, and think about it, imagine if you're at a red light, you make a dua, Ya Allah, change the light to green. But the people coming the other way, they also make the same dua. If the duas are to both be accepted, you'd have a massive accident on the road. So duas are accepted based on a wisdom of Allah. So this individual I know, he told me, and he told me in confidence that at a certain point in his life, he made a certain dua to do a particular action. He didn't have the ability at that time to do the act, but he was building up to it, developing the capacity, developing the ability. He told me that it took him, or eight years later, he was able to do a particular action that he had intended to do. He forgot about that dua he made eight years back. And then one day he sat back and he was telling me he thought about it, and when he looked at the product of what had come out from his endeavors, he realized that he made a dua eight years prior. And that product in his hand was the realization of a dua he made eight years before. So it took him, it didn't take Allah eight years to do it, because Allah just says, kun fayakun, be and it is. But it took this young man eight years to develop the capacity, the ability to produce this thing that he wanted to produce. The point of the story is that don't expect our du'as to be accepted instantaneously. Right? We see this in, in many of our du'as, in du'a iftata, we say something like this, that, oh Allah, I prayed to you and you delayed it and I waited for the acceptance and the answer of my du'a. And then we say, But you delayed it because it was better for me to have something later. Right? But we live in a culture of instant gratification. Right? We want fast internet access. If we don't have our 4G connectivity, we get upset. We don't want to wait to you know, stream on Netflix. We don't want to wait to download. We want our fast food. We want everything fast. But we have to realize that Allah works with His own wisdom. And there is no concept of fastness. Whenever we're ready, whenever we have the ability, Allah will give us what we ask for. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Let me go over a few theological challenges about the du'as and the response that our scholars have given to us. One of the things that people often question is that du'a goes against the fact that we should always believe that whatever Allah has put us in is what He wants. Meaning that why ask Allah for du'a when I'm in my state, I'm in, the, I'm in my predicament and that we should just submit to Allah, right? Why question His authority? But to respond to that at one level, we realize that the dua is actually a form of ibadat. It's a form of worship. We don't make dua simply to get from Allah, to get from God. No, if we look at dua as being a way to talk to God, then we would realize that it's not always about give me, give me, give me. Right? When I talk to my mom and dad or my spouse, I'm not necessarily talking to them to get something. It's just to converse with them, to open my heart, to let them know what I'm facing. How was my day at work? What happened at school? What happened on the commute to work or back home? So look at dua as being a form of ibadah, a form of worshiping Allah, right? Just talking to Allah. And one of the scholars mentioned one time that if you want to see the, that your dua has been accepted, if you want to see that your supplication has been accepted, 
Look if Allah has given you an opportunity to make dua in the next day. Meaning that the dua, the true dua which is accepted is when Allah wants to hear from you every day. Because maybe if Allah gave it to us today, we would forget about him tomorrow. He wouldn't hear from us again until times got rough and we went into difficulties in our life. So the fact is that dua is an act of worship. The Quran encourages us to make dua. Allah actually tells us in chapter 25, Surah Al-Furqan, verse 77, Allah says that what would Allah have, or what use would Allah have for you if it were, if it were not for your duas? That Allah would not need us. He wouldn't care. He would just ignore us. But because we are in constant communication with our Creator, that connection remains strong. That connection remains vibrant. And that in itself is a show that our du'as have been accepted. So if we ever find that we have, connect, we have broken our connection to Allah, that we can go a week or a month or a year without making du'a to Allah, realize that somewhere down the line, Allah doesn't want to talk to us. And we have to try to re, you know, reconnect to Allah. Just as if we are at home and we lose Wi-Fi signal, we, we walk around the house to try to find where we get the best Wi-Fi, or we're in a coffee shop or we're in a restaurant, we lose connection, we try to find where we can get connectivity. We have to look at where we can get reconnected. Maybe it's in Hajj, maybe it's in Karbala, maybe it's in Mashhad, maybe it's coming to Thursday night in my local community and listening to Dua Kumail that that's where the signal is more stronger than at home or somewhere else that, you know, that I'm not getting connection to Allah. So that's one theological question that people ask. Number two is that people say, well, we get whatever we get and we won't get any more from Allah. So if I'm in a mediocre job, I'm making 30, 40,000 a year, and I'm asking or I, I would like to get more, and I'm making dua, or I'm not even making dua, what difference does it make? I'm not going to get any more from Allah. But the answer that our scholars give is very beautiful. And they give us a, a, a practical example, like this glass of water, right? This glass of water is maybe about 8 ounces, maybe 10 ounces of water. If I were to take this 2 liter bottle, I couldn't pour it into that glass without it overfilling and, and, and spilling over. Consider our spiritual heart like that glass. It's limited in its capacity. Allah can only give you and I to our capacity. Not that He can't give us more, but our heart is not receptive to get more of Allah's blessings and barakat and bounties. But if I could somehow expand my heart, if I, not physically obviously, if I could somehow spiritually expand my heart to be more receptive of Allah's blessings, then He can pour it out more in abundance to me. Right? When Prophet Musa made that dua that I started with, Rabbi Shrahli Sadri, O oh Allah, expand my heart. He wasn't talking about open heart surgery and give me a bigger, you know, a bigger heart physically. Give me more capacity, O oh Allah, to take in more of you, of your teachings, of your, of your bounties, so I can give back more. And so, as Allah tells us in the Quran, there's a very beautiful parable where Allah says that He sends down water from the skies and the valleys get filled according to their measure. Right? So my heart, my spiritual heart, maybe is only enough to accept a job of 30,000 pounds every year. I can't accept 100,000 because maybe I'll get corrupt. I'll go towards gambling. I'll go towards a nightlife that's not, that's that detrimental for my world to come. And because my heart has not developed the spiritual capacity to accept it, I won't get it. Maybe I might get it, but maybe I won't. But if I want that from Allah, if I'm asking for a child, I mean, you know, sometimes mothers and fathers ask, what dua can I read to conceive? Well, yeah, there are duas that we can give you and, 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 and different supplications, but are you ready to have a child in your life at that point? Are you ready to deal with a teenager as they grow up? 
If you're not, then Allah has to, you have to build that capacity, capacity building of your heart to be able to deal with that realization when you get to it. And so that's another understanding is that we have to build the, our capacity for Allah to let the blessings flow. The glass will only accept so much. But as I get a bigger container, then I can put two liters of water. Then I get an 18 liter jug. Then I get a bathtub. Then I get a, a, a swimming pool. Then I get an ocean. And I can accept everything. Right? The prophets and imams, they were like an ocean. Whatever Allah gave to them, they wouldn't get corrupt. They didn't let this world get to them. So Allah could shower a trillion dollars on a prophet or a wasi or an awliya of Allah. And Allah knows that that man or woman has developed their heart, their spiritual capacity, that it won't get to them. They'll give in charity. They'll give their khums. As Brother Abdul Rauf mentioned, they'll give to the majlis of Hussein, right? Because that's why we have money at the end of the day. When I get paid and I pay my bills, my leftover it doesn't or should not just sit in a bank, right? That stagnant money that's sitting in my bank account. Save some for your future, no doubt for your children's education, save for Hajj, save for Ziyarat. But when the Majlis of Hussein comes and the organizers have to literally beg for money, they shouldn't have to beg for money. We should, as we walk in that door, say whatever money I have in my purse, whatever I have in my wallet, I'm going to dump it in the container. Every day, do that, right? Do that every day. I have extra money, I'm just going to put it in there. Right? What else am I going to spend it on? What else am I going to do? I've got my home, I've got my car, I've got food in, uh, in my fridge at home. Why not give to the Majlis of Hussein alayhi salam? He gave his life for us. Right? Abul Fadl Abbas gives his two arms that we can learn from that legacy. They didn't have to do it. They could have snapped their fingers. Angels would have come, destroyed the army of Yazid. We would be, not have to be here today. Right? We'd be at home watching television. But when we see that they gave everything for us and the organizers say, give us a few of your pounds, give us a few dollars, give us whatever you can. Right? First of all, they shouldn't have to ask. We should be giving before they ask. But now that they have asked, we need to respond to their call. Right? We say that Imam Hussein said, Hal min nasirin yansurna, who was there to help me? Well, the organizers are asking help. So we weren't there on the day of Ashura to give our lives. But let's give a couple of pounds from our pocket. Let's open up our hearts and give to the organization because they're not spending it on their own. They're giving it back to you and I. This majlis, these majalis, the rental, all of these things are because you are donating and giving in the name of Sayyidul Shuhada alayhi salatu wassalam. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the last point, and I'll conclude before we go into the tragedy for tonight, and I'm going to take a bit of a break before that as well for one last announcement, is that why do our du'as sometimes not go answered? Or apparently we feel that our du'as aren't answered. There's a beautiful hadith from the fourth Imam, Imam Zainul Abideen, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad in which he's quoted as saying al-mu'minu min du'aihi ala thalaf that the true believer is in one of three different states when it comes to his du'as and pay attention to this because this is the answer for why sometimes we feel our du'as are not automatically accepted in addition to all that I just mentioned number one he says imma an yuddakhara lahu meaning that our du'a is heard by Allah it's accepted, but the fulfillment of that dua is postponed until the day of judgment, until paradise. If we, as the hadith say, if we were to have every dua of ours not, ex not fulfilled in this world, and we got to the paradise, and we saw what was waiting for us, hadith says that we would have wished that every dua of ours in this world had gone unanswered by Allah. That's how much we would be getting in the world to come. So answer one, I make a dua. Allah doesn't apparently give it to me right now. He's storing it in our bank account in paradise to collect on that day. 
Number two, imma and yu'ajjala lahu. No, number two, Allah, the, the Imam says, it's given to you right here and now. Right? Like that person I told you about, it took him eight years, but his dua was finally fulfilled in this world. And it took him a while to develop his own capacity to make that realization. But number three is beautiful. He says, He says that the third level is that Allah prevents a tragedy which was going to happen to you. You're driving down one of the motorways, maybe on your way to another part of England or in downtown London and you just narrowly avoid an accident. Wow, what a fluke. I'm such a good driver. No, you had a dua you made that Allah accepted, but Allah said, I'm gonna save that, and I'm gonna make sure that my servant, he's gonna have an accident, or he's, he may be destined to have an accident, I'm gonna prevent it from him. He's not gonna have that in lieu of the dua he made for something completely radically different. So you see that when we have chances in life, when we almost come close to having an accident or a problem in our lives and it's averted from us, it's not a fluke, it's not by chance. Allah is saying you made a dua about something completely different. I'm going to now give you the repayment of that dua through preventing a tragedy from coming across on you. So that's why I said in the beginning that we should always be reading dua. We don't know, is it stored for us in the world to come? Is it going to be given to us right now? Or is it going to be a way that we can be protected from a tragedy? We don't know. So the more dua that we make, the more of a chance that we have in this world or in the world to come. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tonight we mark the companion Hur. And before I speak about him, as I just mentioned that this majlis that the community of Essex has organized, and that I'm sure that they're organizing every year. As you know, and as the emails and the WhatsApps have gone out, it costs money to rent this venue. I'm sure it's not cheap to rent this building. To organize all of this, to have the highly updated sound system that we have tonight, all of this costs money. And obviously money doesn't fall from the sky. We can make dua to Allah for money, but as I said, it's not just going to come by, by chance. We have to do something, brothers and sisters. So I just want to stop for three or four minutes. And the organizers want each and every one of you at this point to reach into your hearts and into your pockets and they're going to be coming around with a cloth and asking each and every one of us to put whatever you can into that cloth. Keep in mind that tonight we're marking the martyrdom of Hur ibn, ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Hur, a man who gave everything that he had. He had the comfort and luxury of being in the camp of Umar ibn Asad. He had life made for him. He had no worries. Right? He could have stayed on that enemy camp. He could have continued to fight against Sayyid al-Shuhada. But he paid the ultimate price by moving over from the dark side over to the side of the camp of Abu Abdullah. And if we can in these next few moments before I go into the tragedy of Hur, if we can, and maybe we've already given on the first night, or the second night, or the third night, or as you walked in, maybe you gave, or maybe you gave online. Whatever way, if you have anything in your pocket, a little bit that you can give, for the sake of this majalis of Sayyidu Shuhada, I believe there's, there are people on the men's side and the ladies' side who are walking around to collect your offerings. And as the hadith tell us that when you give in charity, when you give in sadaqah or you give anything in the way of Allah, that before the money goes into the recipient's hand, it goes into the metaphorical hand of Allah. Allah touches it, He blesses it, and then it goes into the cause. The Quran actually even tells us when Allah told the Muslims of the time of Rasulullah and you and I, Allah says, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ sadaqah." 
He tells Rasulullah, take from the wealth of the people some sadaqah, some charity, some alms. What benefit does it have? Allah tells the Prophet that it will purify those people. It will purify the people and Allah then orders the Prophet to make dua for those people. Allah tells the Rasul, He says, take from their wealth some sadaqah, it will purify them and it will aid in the purification of their wealth. And He says, وَصَلِّ alayhim, Make dua for them. Because inna salataka sakanun lahum. Because your dua for the community, it gives them tranquility, it gives them peace of mind. So when we give that money in the way of Allah, Rasulullah is then being ordered by Allah to make dua for us. To make dua that we can have peace of mind, peace of heart. And on these nights of Muharram, as we know we're on the fourth night, Ashura is six days away. Obviously the organizers have budgets they have to reach. And so we ask that they are, that we are able to open up our hearts and in the love of the companions of Sayyidu Shuhada that we're able to give in this generous cause to keep alive the tragedy of Karbala. Salu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Let me conclude in two or three minutes with the tragedy of Hur. Peace be upon him, a man who is unparalleled really within the history probably of Islam really if, if, if we can look at him from that perspective. As we know when Sayyidah Shuhada finally reached that land of Nainawa, that land of Karbala and he was at a particular point and he had access to the water. He had access to that flowing stream of water and when Hur came with his 1,000 soldiers and 2,000 horses according to the narrations they wanted water, they were thirsty. And Imam Hussein told his family, he told the companions, give the, give the animals that are part of the enemy forces water to drink and give Hur and, the, and, and his soldiers water to drink. And they were fed to their limit that they could drink that day. In fact, it got to a point where they wanted to pray Jamaat prayers on that day. They wanted to pray their prayers and Imam Hussein was leading a Jamaat prayer and guess what? Hur asked Imam Hussein that can we pray Jamaat behind you? Imam Hussein knew that who this man was, he was blocking his way from getting to Kufa. Eventually Hur was going to block the way to go back to Medina or to Mecca. They were cornered from all sides. But yet Imam Hussein said, here take the water you need. A true humanitarian. He said, you want to pray your Salat? Let's pray Jamaat, you can pray behind me. Imam Hussein led them in prayer, although that this was a man who was going to be responsible for the death. Eventually, Hur and his army led Imam Hussein and the family to another location where the water was not accessible. And as we know, those 1,000 soldiers, 2,000 uh, horses that had gathered had encircled the Imam and his camp. Eventually, day after day after day, as more of the enemy soldiers came from Kufa, as the, or, or the orders of Ibn Ziyad, as more and more people began to make their way until it reached 20,000, some say 30,000 soldiers. And Imam Hussein was cornered from all sides. Eventually, the books of Maktal mention that on the day of Ashura, on that tragic 10th day of Muharram, when Umar ibn Asad is looking towards Sayyidah Shuhada, Umar ibn Asad gets that, the, 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 the audacity to say that we're going to start this war immediately and he wants to be the man to start the war. So it can be said that to Yazid that, that he started the war and that he would get the prize and the bounty for this battle to begin. Brothers and sisters, when Umar ibn Asad was speaking these terms against Abu Abdullah, Hur ibn Ziyad, one of the commanders of the army from one of the ranks, he comes to Umar ibn Asad and he says, are you really going to fight against this man? Are you really going to fight against the son 
of the daughter of the Messenger of Allah and he says, by God, I swear I'm going to kill that man. And the easiest thing for me to do on this day is for heads to roll and for body parts to be cut off of their bodies. Brothers and sisters, Hur, this man who had the foresight and had really the love of the Ahlul Bayt deep down in his heart, it took a spark, it took maybe a dua of Imam Hussein for him to open up his eyes. He walks back to his army and one of his generals in his flank of the army, they say, he says that I was looking at Hur and he says that when I would ever think about the bravest, the one who had the most courage and bravery in Kufa, nobody except for the name of Hur came to my mind. His own people are saying, I'm looking at Hur and he's trembling, his body is shaking. And when he asked Hur, he says, oh Hur, why are you acting like this? If I were to be asked who is the bravest, I would say you. And Hur responds, he says that I'm looking at a man and he says that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at heaven and hell on one side. On one side I have paradise calling towards me. On the other hand I have the hellfire beckoning me. And he says by God I'm not going to choose anything except for the, the, the gardens of paradise. At this point, brothers and sisters, although the historians differ on what happens, but ultimately we're told by, in the book al Luhuf of Sayyid Ibn Tawus that, that Hur goes on to his horse. He begins to make his way towards Sayyid al-Shuhada. Again on the day of Ashura, Hur gets to the camp of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein looks at him like, a, like, like he's like a brother in the family. And Imam Hussein welcomes this man into the camp. He welcomes him into the army. Hur is looking at him with his head down towards Abba Abdullah. He turns to his master, his Imam, and he says, Oh Abba Abdullah, is there any way for me to do Tawbah? He says, is there any way for me to turn back to Allah? Imagine brothers and sisters for a moment, we're all sinners at one level or another. We've committed sins, we've done things against Allah. But we at least haven't stood up against the son of Rasulullah, against the son of the daughter of Rasulullah. Our sins are minor. But Hur comes to the Imam and he knows that he is guilty for blocking the Imam from day one. And he asks his Imam that is there a toba for me? And Imam Hussein says in a very beautiful way, only the way that the grandson of Rasulullah could say, he says that if you turn to Allah, he says that Allah will turn back to you. Yes, you will be forgiven if you make amends to Allah. Brothers and sisters, Hur makes that tawbah to Allah. Imam Hussein welcomes him into the family. He says, you're like a brother to us. He says, Hur, where have you been? We've been waiting for you all of these days. Imam Hussein must be lamenting at this point that usually when a guest comes to your home, you offer him some food, you offer him some water. But what can Imam Hussein offer to Hur? Ali Asghar hasn't had water. Ali Akbar hasn't had a drink of water. Nobody's had water. What can Imam Hussein give to his guest on this day of Ashura? Brothers and sisters, eventually Hur tells Imam, he says, oh my master, he says that I was the first one to block your way from going to Kufa. He says, allow me to be the first one at this juncture to go and give my life. Let me go and sacrifice my life for you, oh my master. Imam Hussein with full appreciation, he gives Hur the permission, he goes into the battlefield. We can only imagine what was happening, what was going into the minds of those enemy soldiers. They're seeing one of their own people who was a few moments ago with them. Hur comes into the battlefield. Historians say he kills about 20 of the enemy forces. Eventually, however, Hur is overcome by the enemies. The people begin to encircle him. They begin to attack Hur one by one. As every companion would do, as every family member would do, they would call out the name of Abu Abdullah. Imam Hussein would beckon to that call. He would respond to that last salam. Eventually, as Hur leaves this world, as he's about to leave this world, Imam Imam Hussein looks at him, he says, O oh, Hur, he says, O oh, Hur, with the name which means the free man. He says, O oh, Hur, you are, you are just as your mother named you free. He says, Anta Hur fil dunya, wa anta Hur fil akhira. You are a free man in this world, and you are a free man in the world to come. With that, Hur leaves this world, and Imam Hussein has to pay that difficult price of losing such a man, such a man who gave his life on the day of Ashura. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلِبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We ask Allah by the right of Fatima 
and her father and her husband and her two beautiful sons that Allah accept this act of worship from us on this Thursday night. We ask Allah to accept our du'as. We ask Allah to accept all of the hajat. All of us have some difficulty in our life. We ask Allah to by the right of Hur, by the shafa'at of Hur, we ask Allah to accept each and every one of our tears and du'as on this night. We ask Allah to give us the intercession of men like Hur on the Day of Judgment. And we ask Allah to allow us to be in the company of our 12th Imam, and that we can turn in repentance before the time of the Imam, and that we can be worthy of being the servants and helpers of Imam al-Zaman. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta as-sami'ul alim. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.